Okay, time to switch off your, your cell phones again. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce a very good colleague of mine, very good friend, I would say. We go back to 99 when I was running JET, and Ambrogio did his first experiments on uh, plasmas in, in JET that I, that I was running. Since then, Ambrogio made a very, very steep career. He became full professor in Lausanne in the end and the head of the Swiss Plasma Center, which was opened some time ago, I think uh, two months exactly. Uh, they had an opening event uh, just like this one. Um, I think uh, Ambrogio is going to give us a very nice bird's eye view on fusion physics, fusion instrumentation, and uh, I'm really excited to, to have you here, Ambrogio. Go for it. Thank you very much, Marco. It's a great pleasure to be here. I will uh, try to give you some uh, highlights of what um, we do in, in plasma physics for what I call burning plasmas. I will define what I mean by them. Uh, we have quite a few similarities between uh, the center I have the pleasure to direct and, and this place. We are also quite a large center embedded in an academic campus. In fact, you can see here, um, one thing you don't have is the lake. One thing we don't have, and I have been fighting for it, but not successfully yet, is the bridge. Because I think it's a bridge. These are our buildings, and, and the rest of the campus is across the street. But the bridge is a very important idea. I'm, I'm very serious about this. Um, we will uh, see together that also there are very common approaches between the two, the two labs and the common themes. And uh, these would be essentially the examples I will choose. But I'd like to start from a sort of a general reminder of what we're trying to do in general. Uh, if you see at uh, the binding energy curve per nucleon that you have in, in nuclei as a function of atomic number, you can immediately understand that you can gain energy in two ways. You can gain energy if you go from right to left, that is by splitting large nuclei, and that's of course the process of nuclear fission. And you gain Quite a bit of energy going down in this curve, so you go down towards the most stable nuclei, uh, iron, uh, typically. Or you can do the other way around, from left to right, and that is the process of nuclear fusion. So you put together light nuclei, you go down very steeply in a curve, which means per unit mass you gain even much more energy than you do in a nuclear fission. And that's, of course, the way the stars work. That's the way, in fact, the universe, in a sense, was constructed. Now, the star put together uh, protons to form a helium a nucleus in a, in a chain that takes a long time. Uh, we can't afford taking such a long time to make fusion on Earth. You have to explore other reactions. And there's different reactions that we can look at um, in terms of their probability of happening as a function of temperature or their reactivity um, as plotted here. And of course, we like to start with the one that's the easiest, that's the most likely to happen for a given temperature. And we identified immediately that as being the deuterium tritium reaction. So you have the two isotopes of hydrogen that are going to be smashed together to come close enough so that you can really have the nuclear force taking over from the uh, electrostatic repulsion from the positive nuclei, and then turn into a helium nucleus, that is an alpha particle, and a neutron. So this is the blue curve, and that's the one we will be focusing on. But even the blue curve, which is the best of all, needs, in order to have you know, decent uh, reactivity, temperature values that are of the order of tens of kV or tens of millions of degrees. So we are in the presence of a plasma. That's the only matter that can exist in uh, these uh, temperatures. So let's focus on this reaction, which is the one, again, that would give us hope for the first generations of reactors, at least. Deuterium tritium, two isotopes, neutron at 14 MeV. And the energy is very large, which implies also that the material aspects of fusion are very important. And the helium at 3.5 MeV. 3.5 is much more than the temperature with which we'll produce these reactions, which will be in the order of 10 to 20. KV. So this is a very non-thermal particle we need to keep in the plasma in order to self-sustain the reactivity. Now the fuels, um, deuterium 
is absolutely no problem. Because deuterium is 0.01% of uh, all the hydrogenic atoms in the oceans. The fraction is relatively small, but there are a lot of hydrogenic atoms in the ocean. So 1.6 grams per liter, you can think of an immense amount that's essentially available for us for, I would say, almost infinite time. Tritium does not exist in nature. Tritium is not there for us to um, take it as a fuel, but and because it is radioactive and, and short-lived, it's about 12 years of half uh, life, but it can be produced from lithium. And lithium can be mined itself, as it is nowadays, or can be uh, extracted from ocean water in uh, decent amounts. It's 0.1 grams per cubic meter. So it's also quite a large amount if you think about the oceans. Um, the reaction we will uh, use is the nuclear reaction between the neutron that's issued by the DT fusion reaction itself and lithium, maybe I shouldn't go into the details, but it's lithium-6, which is only about 7% of natural lithium, but the cross-section is so large we don't even need to enrich lithium in order for that to happen in a relatively efficient way. And that reaction produces exactly what we want, that is a tritium nucleus, a triton, in addition, it produces another alpha particle and even more energy. And that's what we call the tritium breeding process. Now, that in practice will be performed by what we call a blanket, so something we put around the plasma in which a nuclear reaction will take place. And there are different kinds of technology uh, incarnations of this blanket. This is one example that's developed by, by our, our friends at CEA in, uh, in France. All of them, of course, have to have lithium in it. And the way you actually make it circulate and so on is still not so um, defined, but research is ongoing. So this blanket around will produce the treatment we need for the reaction. So that means that the fuels, they need to come out, they need to come in your reactor, they need to be bought, if you like, and uh, brought in the plant, are not the German tritium, are the German lithium. These are the primary fuels. So they come in, the term is going to be put in the chamber where the plasma will uh, burn, and lithium will be put in a blanket that will surround the plasma where the nuclear reaction will take place from, uh, with the neutron, and that the tritium will be basically be kept in a closed circuit. So what comes in is lithium and deuterium. What comes out is energy in the form of a, a hot fluid that's created by the neutrons uh, that are captured in the blanket, and a little bit of helium that you produce in your reaction. So that's the schematic of a fusion reactor. A reactor. We will focus on a magnetic concept, which is based on trapping the particles that are forming a plasma in the cage made of magnetic field. I'd like to really stress the advantages of fusion because this is really uh, our core business. Why do we struggle for so long and so intensely to try and achieve fusion? First of all, the energy density you can get in fusion is incredibly high. I'd like to really quantify that with a quantity that's called specific energies number of megajoules per kilograms in your fuel, if you like. If you take water and put it 100 meters high, that's in this amount, in this uh, unit, is 0.001. 0.001 megajoule per kilo. If you burn fossil fuels, coal, oil, or other chemical reactions, if you eat chocolate, as I should, being in Switzerland, you, or spaghetti, as I should, being Italian, you get tens of megajoules per kilograms. Tens. If you go nuclear, then you have 85 millions. So the jump here really makes us understand that the energy density is a completely different game. If you go to fusion, it's even much higher, 350 millions. 350 million megajoules per kilogram, as opposed to a few tens. And that's as close as you, as close as you can get to actually transform all the mass into energy by just E equal mc square. That's 90 billion. That's not that far from what fusion can do. So because of that, and because the fuels are distributed around, say, in, in ocean water, we can say they, they are practically inexhaustible. And the two pictures here I have taken myself in two different parts of the ocean, in two different parts of the planet, also reminds us that this fuel is much better distributed than any other fuel we can think of, except, of course, uh, sunlight. There's no greenhouse gas emission, obviously, there's no combustion, and there's no long-lasting radioactive waste. Why do I specify no long-lasting radioactive waste? Because with the materials that we use at the moment for the structure of the reactor, there will be some activation due to the 14 MeV neutrals that come out. But the activation is limited to the structure of the reactor itself, so it's not going to be released in terms of waste, and it's only lasting some decades 
with the present choice of materials and can be even much less with a smarter choice of materials in the future. It's safe. First of all, there's no link with nuclear weapons. Second, there's no risk of loss of control of the reactions. The concept is not based on the chain reaction. So we cannot, if you lose control of the plasma, if something bad happens to the plasma, the plasma will terminate. So we'll make a little less money selling electricity, but there will not be a loss of control in terms of safety problems. And at any given time, in the reactor itself, as a kind of a exemplified by this picture, we have very, very, very small amount of fuel just because of this fantastically high energy density. We're talking about grams. In a reactor with grams of fuel that would be burning to produce energy, to produce you know, power station levels of energy. So I said we trap the plasma, which is made of individual charges, if you like, nuclear and electro separated, so subject to electromagnetic fields. We trap them in a very sophisticated cage made of magnetic fields, which I will spare the detail of, but in the present generation, which is in the form of what's called a tokamak, a concept that's based on having uh, fields produced by magnetic coils that will be superconducting in the uh, next generation devices, in some of the present ones, in fact, and currents that actually flow in the plasma itself, the plasma when it's hot as it should be in order to fuse is a, almost a perfect conductor, so it's easy to drive a current in it, and that's the idea of the tokamak. So the combination of the external fields produced by the coils and the fields produced by the current in the plasma makes sort of a complicated helical structure for the field, which is optimized to trap the particles of the plasma inside, and in fact the whole plasma in a macroscopic equilibrium in such a situation. So that's a tokamak. And uh, people say sometimes, well, this fusion research takes a long time. Sure, it's, you're making a star on Earth is not, not easy, but the progress has been terrific. It's not true that it's been slow. It's been terrific. And the reason I uh, use this graph is exactly to show that. This graph is uh, showing the plasma temperature here as a function of uh, what we call the triple product or fusion performance. It's the amount of plasma you can trap times the confinement time, times the time in which you can trap it, times the temperature at which you trap it. And you can see that, in fact, it was quite, quite easy to jump up in temperature to tens or even hundred millions of degrees quite early. What was more difficult was to push to the right. In other words, to do a plasma, to make a plasma that's heat, that's hot, but also dense and also confined for a long time. And we made these jumps. And this is, of course, a, a scale uh, with exponential here. We made these jumps and add all the way to the last real deuterium experiments made in the end of the 90s at JET, at the European machine, where we almost got what we call Q of one, which means the fusion gain of one. So in other words, almost the same fusion power produced as the power put in. Now, this fusion gain, when it assumes the value of one, means absolutely nothing except a sort of a psychological uh, barrier. It's called break-even. What counts is when it's bigger than five and bigger than 10 and so on. And uh, why? Because if you think of what the plasma does when it's really making reactions that is heated by the alpha particles, which are uh, one of the two products of the reaction. The alpha particles carry about one-fifth of the fusion um, reaction energy, uh, one-fifth of the power on average. And if you calculate the fraction of the heating that comes from themselves, in other words, the sort of self-heating of the plasma, as a, uh, divided by the total uh, heating of the plasma, that's about Q divided by Q plus five, okay? That's a little bit of algebra, which means that the real game changer will be when you have a gain that's larger than five, because at that time you have self-heating of the plasma will dominate over what you can do from outside. That's what we call a burning plasma. We don't have that yet. We need to work towards that, and that's the regime in which we will be making power from fusion. Q plus Five is just, of course, the barrier between, or the, the kind of mathematical limit between being dominated by external heating and between dominated by internal heating. So we need to go higher than that. And that's exactly what we want to do uh, with the next steps uh, of experiments, which I uh, will show you um, now. And the next one, in fact, is what we're building now, ITER. That will be the first burning plasma that will be created on Earth. And it will demonstrate that we can do it. It will demonstrate that we can do it scientifically, we can do it technologically, and that it is safe. So to burn means to have a gain larger than five. In fact, to really burn means be of the order of 10, and that's what we want. So the promise to make a Q of 10 in ITER. 
and not just for small amount of power above half, half a gigawatt. So that's sort of almost a power plant level for a macroscopic time minutes. This is a construction site of ITER. It's quite a gigantic uh, construction. Um, it has been uh, encountering some difficulties. I mean, and more recently, I, I would say we have regained a lot of faith in the project. It's been now dealt with, with a real project approach that maybe was not all the way uh, present through uh, the project. But now you can see the site growing very and changing very fast. So my pictures are becoming obsolete every week, and that's a very good thing. Um, so this is a picture of the machine. You see the size of a person. There would be about a thousand cubic meter of plasma. That's the volume of a of a nice villa, uh, immersed in a field on, of the order of five tesla, and having a current of the order of fifteen millions of amperes to create this nice magnetic cage that will trap the plasma in. So that's ITER. That's not the end of research because it will be one step more. We need to demonstrate not only that we can do it, that we can do it safely, but that we can also do it at the level at which commercial feasibility becomes possible. And that step is referred to as demo. It will need to have parameters like a power plant, so gain of order 30 or 40, thermal power of the order of 3 gigawatts, which means electrical power, say, about 1 gigawatt, and it will be steady state. And different options are being explored around the world. The European option is, is here. You see other countries are looking at different uh, possibilities. China, uh, you can see from the uh, drawing itself, is, of course, pushing even harder than all the others uh, to make it as early as possible. Let me just say a, a little bit what the, I think the building blocks are for reaching this regime and, are, and maintaining, and there I show some examples. We have to reach the conditions in which a plasma will burn, which means we have to heat it. That's not so difficult, although we have to heat it at a high density and at, without spoiling and confinement. We need to control somehow the transport, the turbulence that tends to kick out the energy and the particles. And once we get the burning condition, we need to sustain them. So we need to really take care of this self-heating process in the plasma, keep the plasma stable and control it in the presence of this very large population of alpha particles, which we don't have today. And also we need to make sure that the burning conditions are not just nice for physics, but they are compatible with reactor operation, which means, first of all, we can exhaust the power and the particles in an efficient way, and second of all, we can actually maintain the uh, walls of the machine in a decent state for a long time. And we have to really also see the implications for the proper reactor operations like, and, and economy for fusions like uh, treating, uh, breeding the tritium and burning up in an efficient way and having a good uh, uh, thermodynamical efficiency of our plant. I, I show some examples of how to sustain the burning conditions first, and I remind you again that the refusion reaction is this tritium and this plasma self-heating comes from the alpha particles. A long way to slow down by giving the energy from 3.5 MeV to 15 keV, and that's about seconds. It's not milliseconds in a big machine like, like ITER. So during those seconds, the many interactions that the alphas can have. I show you one example that will uh, also lead to some of the studies we do, both in Lausanne and you do here in, in, uh, in Holland. If the ions can be lost due to a variety of things. This is an example of when they can be ejected from the core of the plasma because of some macroscopic instability in the core of the plasma. This plasma is sort of oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down in its pressure or in its temperature. And when you have a disoscillation, you have a, a build up of the performance in a core that's nice, but then you have a collapse. And that collapse kicks things out, kicks, kicks the plasma out and it kicks the fast ions out. So. The first time is in turn influence this instability that would lead to these repetitive collapses. And in particular, it influences the period over which the instability occurs. And the fast ions can make it longer. And if you make it longer, you're happy for a while because you can build up your pressure, so you build up your performance. But the longer you make it, the more violent will be your collapse. So you have, you have to compromise between the length of your good performance phase and the dramatic aspect of the collapse. And you had to play with control uh, of the fast ions and of these instabilities to make an optimal choice between these two things. Also, once the collapse happens, not only do you have particles that are kicked out, but this fact of being kicked out triggers other instabilities that are just about ready to be 
kicked in your plasma. The plasma is a, a source of many instabilities because it has a lot of thermodynamical, thermodynamical potential, a lot of strong gradients, and so on. So we need to control the period of this instability here, and maybe even control the resulting instability that you can have um, if, there you, if you have collapses. So let's see. Uh, how we do it. This is an example of a tokamak that we have uh, today. It's a tokamak we have in Lausanne. It's called the TCV, a tokamak a variable configuration, which is illustrated by these many, many shapes we can make in the plasma. And you can see that this is uh, beautiful, but it's also very interesting because the different shapes have different properties for transport, for stability, and even for interactions between the plasma and the and the wall. But you can also imagine this is a challenge for, for control. And in fact, in many cases, we came to, to you guys and say, well, there's a very interesting uh, laboratory for plasma control and for control in general. And that's where plasma physics and control uh, technology actually match. And that's also where our two labs really collaborated, one, one of the examples. The other specificity we have is that we have a quite a large uh, electron cyclotron power, which means the power of microwaves that resonate with the motion of the electrons. And this recently, in fact, in these very days, we're also installing a beams to heat the ions. And these are the different lines with which we carry the waves to heat the plasma. This is an example of an experiment run, in fact, by your personnel on our, on our facility, in which we are controlling the waves we inject in the core of the plasma to, in fact, determine the period of this oscillation I was showing you. And this period, as you see, is controlled in a, in a very uh, systematic and precise way by modulating the power of the microwaves that you inject in the core of the plasma. By controlling the period, you can control in the height of the crashes, and you can control also the secondary instability. Speaking of secondary instability, this is another example. In fact, this very simulation uh, came from a student of yours who came to do a PhD uh, thesis with us. Again, marrying plasma physics and control, and now he's back in Holland, I guess, as a, as a faculty uh, member, and he still collaborates a lot with us. So this is an instability uh, that's generated by a collapse. It's a consequence of the collapse. It's a bubble in the plasma that rotates. It's terrible, because it flattens your profile. And if it flattens your profile, you lose performance in the core. So you lose 30 40% of performance in the core, 30 40% of fusion energy in the core. That's a lot. What do you do? Well, the idea is to go and surgically remove it by injecting a microwave beam just at the right location, just at the right time where the bubble is developing. And that's not just a cartoon, that's a reality. It's a simulation based on real data, and that happens, that works. So we've done it, and uh, you need to do it in a, control, uh, in, in, in a clever controlled way, but it works. Now, because it works, it will be transformed from a university academic environment, a nice little PhD thesis, into ITER. Now, this the way we do it in, in uh, TCV. It's a mirror this big. It's about 15 kilos. It's moved in real time to look and to zap the instability when it's about to grow. And ITER says, OK, that's a great idea. Let's do it for ITER. Now, instead of being a 15 kilos object, it's a 20,000 kilos object to inject the beam in ITER. And that's how. It's also an example of how you can kind of uh, extract a basic principle from a relatively small experiment and extrapolate it to a nuclear environment like Keter. Now, we do that in a consortium with many, many uh, people and uh, uh, across Europe. Uh, but that's really something that's happening. And this is one of the approaches we have in carbon, I think. Now, the second uh, aspect of extrapolating this technique to ITER is to have to really be clever and detecting the mode, regardless of the precision you can have of your um, uh, detection system and, and your injection. So one of the ideas that came from, from here is to detect and inject along the same line. So you don't have problem of absolute mistakes, absolute errors in the position of the mode with respect to the position of the injection of your beam. And another point is that you can do this in a, in a clever way, again, marrying control um, ideas with plasma physics, having a model predictive control for optimizing the whole discharge trajectory. So not just taking measurements and transforming them into actuator in a, in a blind or in a very uh, simple way, but having in between a 
plasma simulation code that tells you where the discharge is evolving so you can really in real time adapt your control system to make the clever uh, choice. This is a, one, of the, one of the things they've been developed together and it's called the Raptor code. It's being used all across Europe to do this kind of a very clever uh, optimization of the discharge, discharge uh, trajectory. Um, another, another example I'd like to mention is, uh, has to do with the compatibility of the burning condition with reactor operation. The exhaust of power and particles is something that's very crucial, and of course, the interaction between this plasma and the wall is also very crucial. The first wall of our machine has to exhaust the heat and the particles, as I said, but it has to keep the plasma pure, otherwise the plasma will not perform as it should for fusion. It has to minimize the retention of tritium. We, these grams we put in have to be in the plasma, not in the walls. It has to provide containment of vacuum, and it also has to allow the fueling of the core of the plasma. Now, when we speak of the loading of the wall, we have extreme conditions. Let's compare them with what we have in mind uh, from different systems. A, few, a fission reactor, typically, or, or a turbine for an airplane, or even a spacecraft when it enters the atmosphere, it has of the order of one megawatt per square meter as thermal loading. The nose of the space shuttle may be a couple, maybe two, maybe three, but nothing like 10. We have, a, we have 10 megawatt per square meter in the critical regions of our reactor in ITER. The launching of a, of a uh, rocket reaches more, it reaches about 80, but only for, of course, a very short time. So we are in extreme conditions. And ITER knows that. ITER has to deal with that. And the choice of materials has been made for ITER. Uh, the diverter will be made, which is the region where, where we get most of the heat out, uh, will be made of tungsten, which is good because it has low retention of tritium and it has a high threshold for sputtering. The walls around will be made of uh, beryllium, which has uh, similar properties and low Z, and also pumps high, uh, oxygen pretty well. We also have to choose the materials so that we don't deteriorate their properties, uh, thermic and mechanical, under the strong neutron irradiation that we have. Now, what are the challenges? The, in addition to the steady state uh, loading of, uh, of power, we also have very violent instabilities. Like you have a kind of the surface of the stars, if you like, because you have very large gradients, maybe the largest gradients you can think of in pressure in, a, in the whole universe. Um, over a few millimeters, we go from, you know, hotter than the center of the sun to essentially room temperature. And these generate very violent modes that give you bursts of energy and particles. And in, in ITER, we have gigawatts for, 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 by, uh, for, for square meter in, uh, in these ejections, which of course is intolerable. So we need to think about what to do there. We also need to think about what the plasma does there um, in these conditions and, and what the materials will become under those fluxes of plasmas. And this is one of the things that's actually being explored here. And I think it's fair to say this is a really unique facility for studying these things, for studying plasma wall interaction. The idea is not to make a huge tokamak to look at the effect of the plasma. Why do you need that? We need here just a very focused plasma that goes on the target with the same kind of power loading that you expect, not only in normal operation, but also during these violent instabilities you will anticipate unfortunately may happen in Rita and in, in, in uh, even further the other reactor. This is Magnum PSI, uh, which I have just seen downstairs. And these are examples, this is one example of uh, a simulation of one of these events that we fear in a ITER and in a reactor for uh, a power loading of the material surface, with, in this case more than a gigawatt per square meter and with a repetition rate uh, 100 hertz, which is also something that we need to look at. So we can look in this kind of machine at the effects of uh, the plasma on the, on the material surfaces without having a complex tokamak around. Now we're also looking at possible new ways of dealing with the interaction between the plasma and the walls by having different configurations uh, that surround the plasma, in particular different magnetic configuration, because the material limits will not only be approached like in ITER, but it will be exceeded in machines after it. So we need to do something, we must do something. We cannot just go on and hope the materials by miracle will tolerate more than 10 or 20 megawatt per square meter. So what can we do? We can think of different configurations. For example, we can also think even more in a more revolutionary way that we can have 
liquid metals flowing instead of actual wall, liquid metals flowing along a, a small thin layer. And this is something that's being investigated here. We, we don't do that in our home lab, but this is something that's being investigated here. Oh, we can think of a very clever configuration for the magnetic edge uh, mag uh, field um, that extracts the energy out and that alleviates this problem of the power loading. And these are examples of these two, um, or two examples of these kind of configurations of the uh, details on the magnetic structure at the edge. I won't go into the details of, but I will mention that one of these two is so-called snowflake diverter has been uh, pioneered in, in, in Lausanne. And on this snowflake diverter, which implies simply having more legs in your magnetic field expansion than the usual diverter, there's a lot of studying being made together with, with your teams, I, I skipped this, um, for the properties that you can have. And if the potential is there, we really to go and extrapolate the reactor. Now, one of the things we, had, we will do in the future, the near future is to have a, an installation of a, a real chamber in the machine to, to create the diverter chamber, diverter area, um, diverter volume where the plasma can radiate more, the neutrals will be um, more dense so that you can create the cushion between the plasma and the walls and explore uh, that in the variable the configurations that you can optimize the concept. So this is, an, again, an example where you can do in a relatively simple uh, academic environment, but that can have potential for, for uh, future uh, machines. We will also use some high temperature conduct, uh, superconducting um, coils as a demonstration technology for, for the fission. We collaborate a lot on these points um, with the teams here. And uh, this is a kind of a summary of what the specificities of a burning plasma uh, can be. And it's complicated because the purpose of the study is actually to be complicated and to say, not only can we try to control things from outside with all different actuators, we need to drive the current in the plasma, we need to fuel the plasma, we need to pump, we need to inject power to heat, we need to make it rotate if we can, but the plasma will be heating itself from inside. The plasma will be dominated by the power from the alpha particles. And that would be sort of self-organized by the plasma itself. It would be difficult to affect entirely what happens in the plasma in a burning plasma, in a burning regime. So all of this uh, coupling is due to these properties of the alpha particles that would be dominating the heating. So there will be transport that would be related to the profiles, that would be related to the heating, which will be related to where the fusion takes, uh, reaction takes place, and so on and so forth. What we can do from outside is to be as smart as we can, to control the different aspects and maybe not entirely control the plasma when we will burn, but in fact kick it in one state or the other that would be beneficial for the operation of, of the reactor. And that is something that we really uh, are, are working on together. So there are these blocks. I've seen, I've seen, seen uh, some examples. We've seen some examples together. Progress must be achieved on these separate blocks. And in fact, I believe DIFFER really provides an outstanding example of how these different problems are isolated and then address them one by one in depth. So when I always, uh, when I discuss, you know, with my colleagues what to do, it's always a good example. We need to understand, I mean, the good people not only are good at answering questions, but are really good at identifying a question. And you are, I think, a very good example. And we are really working together on you know, some of these, on these questions. So we have to do that. We have to separate the building blocks and we have to understand the uh, individual phenomena, if you like, as much as possible. But at the same time, in a burning plasma, the coupling of these elements will be essential. It will make extrapolation from what we can do today in only weekly self heated plasma difficult and may lead to complete new phenomena. So we need to, at the same time, in our respective labs, address the physics and technology of these individual blocks, but also build the real thing. That is the real burning plasma that will take place, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ambrogio. Very nice. I guess there are questions. Yeah. Uh, Ambrogio, <coughs> uh, two weeks ago, the Fusion was on the cover page of Time magazine, and probably you read the article. So they first of all criticized the fact that all the effort, all the money goes to one configuration, the Tokamak. <clears throat> and then it was about private initiatives and small companies. 
uh, mainly in the United States and Canada and one in the UK, using alternative configurations. So do you think these initiatives uh, make sense? Can they really help to reach uh, fusion at, at an earlier state? Yes. Uh, first of all, they're not all on the same on the same scientific level, should I say. Some of them have claims that are totally, uh, let's say, exaggerated. Some, some others have uh, taken a very uh, sound approach. I think it's great for fusion that people are trying different things, that people are trying to go as fast as, 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 uh, as possible. The, again, some of the privacy investors are investing in concepts that maybe are significantly behind the concept of the tokamak. I will see. Maybe, maybe they will one day reach the development level that we, that we have. Um, it's not true that the entire funding on fusion, the public funding on fusion is spent on tokamak. There are significant investment in what's called a stellarator, which is a slightly alternative, slightly different way of making this magnetic cage. And the biggest stellarator ever is about to open in, in Greifswald in north of Germany. Uh, but I, I more than welcome all of the initiatives from, from private, of course, to have alternative approaches, faster fusion and so on, as long as they don't kind of criticize in a non-scientific way what mainstream is. First of all, for example, if you want to have a, a, a fusion reactor based on DT, which I think is most reasonable, you have to have a blanket that produces tritium. And when people say, I can do a tabletop device, they just have not looked at the you know, Neutronics 101. In neutron cross-section, there's not much you can do about it. They are the way they are. So you need about a meter to slow down a neutron, breed tritium, and, and, uh, and screen and, and shield. So, you know, my point is that demo should not be bigger than ITER. But if you tell me they will be this big, I just don't believe you. It's because of cross-sections of neutrons. Okay, now the people say, well, we don't, we don't do neutrons. We do proton-boron reactions. But then you, then you have cross-sections that are so small and you need to go to 400 millions of degrees, and then you have to tell me how you confine the plasma at those temperatures and so on. So all the processes are possible. I, I was, uh, in fact, in an event uh, with the students uh, in Prague yesterday and the day before yesterday, and I met the person for it, from ITER, and she told me that they opened up uh, the possibility of a private sponsorship of ITER, which is of parts of ITER. And of course, at the moment, it's only in the form of, of uh, grants for students and scientists and so on, but I think it's a fantastic... Uh, opening, which I actually didn't expect, at least in the previous management of ITER, I, I asked the question, I, I, the answer was just a laugh, which I thought was a bit unfair, but, uh, uh, but why not? So it's happening in Europe as well. Okay, I have to make a very short huishoudelijke mededeling. There will be uh, another lab tour uh, starting in a few minutes, so if you want to go to the lab tour, I think you have to leave the discussion now. We will continue this discussion for another few minutes. So, are there other questions? Yeah? You show that there are several initiatives worldwide in one of your, one of your first slides. Um, which part of the big challenges uh, are, is tackled uh, in a global effort and where are scientists and engineers actually competing for the different designs or approaches? Can you comment on that? No, it, it is a global effort and it is a sort of a, it's a, a pro and it's con at the same time. It was built as a peaceful global effort, uh, initially from Reagan and Gorbachev, blah, 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 um, with the idea that the technology and know-how will be built in parallel in all, the, in all the participants, which of course is not the most effective way of proceeding, but it's the most effective way if the end I, you know, goal is to have all of them at the same level. So it is a global effort and things are provided in kind for the, by different participants, which is not easy, but and maybe that's why it's taking a little longer. But it's a way that people actually develop their own know-how. So it is really collaborative effort. Not all the world is in ITER, but almost. But the, the other... And, uh, and the step uh, after that, I think it would be, in my opinion, if ITER really works as, as it should be, then it would be more than one device. So, and so Korea, Japan, etc., they built on ITER rather than having some kind of parallel developments? They, they are going almost in parallel. We, we in Europe, we, we also try to go partly in parallel with ITER, in the sense that the step after it, we not wait at the end of ITER, otherwise it would be too late. 
um, and of course the Chinese are saying, well, you would, we, we will go even, even earlier, but it will be based on what we learn, at least from the initial phase of it. There, would be, there could be different approaches. The Americans are now pushing for a high temperature superconducting machine. Again, it's, it made the, fir the first page of some, or I don't know, in the New York Times or something, um, but it's easy to say. Uh, you, you know, you, you, one thing is to make a tape of superconducting, high temperature superconducting. One thing is to make a, 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 a magnet that has, you know, a thousand cubic meter of volume at uh, 10 Tesla and a lot, of a lot of stress. So I think we have to build that up also. Thank you. Thank you. There was another question here, I think. Yeah, Dan? Do we understand that this this release of energy is is the main challenge? The, the what? The the, re the release of energy. The release, the, the, the exhaust. Like yeah, yeah. Auto it's one of the main challenges. Yes. Is, is it something you can influence in a positive way? Let's say that you force the system to release. I, I, I'm, I'm that sorry. you that you also can not wait and see how it develops, but that you imply a system in which you force the release of energy. Well, the, pr the problem is not that the energy is not coming out. The problem is the, the energy is coming out on surfaces that are <laughs> not withstanding the, the power load. So, and at the same time, we don't want to make the machine too big. Because of course, that could be a relatively simple solution. In fact, it's not that simple even because it turns out that the, the, if you increase the machine, you only gain with the linear size of the machine and not with the square, as you would imagine, because the power is concentrated because of plasma physics at the edge on a particular thin layer. So you gain with R, not with R square, which is a very, very pathetic ga gain, in fact, if you make it bigger. So the power is coming out, and we are trying to optimize the way it's coming out. For example, we would like it to ra be radiated by the layer at the edge as opposed to being convected or conducted by the plasma because if it's radiated, it's isotropically radiated and it's much better than just going on a particular spot. So we're trying to combine this regime. Now we can do that. We can radiate the power, but we have to do it, and that's one of the interdisciplinarity of plasma, if you like. We have to do it compatibly with the optimized operation of the core. Core must be pure, must be super well confined, the edge must be radiating all the power before the plasma gets to the wall. And these two things are not easy to combine. I guess there's room for one last question. If not, I suggest we thank Ambrogio again. Thank you. Ambrogio, as a token of our oh. appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one.